And by the mid-1950s, those who barred Asian Americans from sharing this kind of life faced a growing outcry from other white Californians, who saw such discrimination as both a vehicle for communist misinformation and propaganda, and also as the belittling of American troops' sacrifices in Asia. And during the San Jose incident that I began with, for example, a local veterans group publicly condemned the whites involved in the episode of discrimination there for, quote, allowing the communists to make propaganda from an incident like this, unquote. Now, in portraying cases of anti-Asian American housing discrimination as international rather than domestic incidents, white journalists and citizens blurred the line between Asians and Asian Americans. Black civil rights leaders encountered great resistance when they tried to use the Cold War arguments to advance African American rights. Uh, white Southern policymakers frequently equated black activism with communism, while federal officials and policymakers usually tried to silence civil rights protesters rather than acknowledging their grievances. In contrast, members of the public in California almost automatically identified Asian American victims of housing discrimination with Asia in the Cold War. During the first well-publicized episode of anti-Asian American housing discrimination, a newspaper column called the Chinese American victim involved someone who was, quote, an ally of ours in the struggle against communism, unquote. Responding to a 1953 incident of discrimination, the Watsonville Register of Pajeranian newspaper portrayed it as something that, quote, could give a community a lasting black eye and do immeasurable damage to the cause of the United States, unquote. And these journalists were not simply imposing their own views uh, of these situations. They were, in fact, repeating the sentiments of other community members. Uh, in, in fact, in each of these six housing discrimination incidents, white Californians flooded the families in question with apologies and scores of offers of homes elsewhere, something African-Americans who just experienced discrimination did not receive when their problems became public. A television shop owner who lived in San Leandro, uh, where one of these incidents occurred, spoke for many of these white residents. He said, quote, we spend millions of dollars all over the world to combat communist propaganda, and then some little incident like this helps to destroy all the good that we've done. Now, by 1954, the impact of the anti-Asian American incidents and of the deepening Cold War was becoming apparent in urban and suburban California. Within two years of the first highly publicized anti-Asian American incident, residents of some all-white Bay Area communities were starting to express growing acceptance of potential Oriental, as they called them, uh, Oriental neighbors, even as they still rejected potential black neighbors. Realtors, a racially conservative group particularly sensitive both to their own image and to white community sentiment, confirmed the growth of this attitude among their clients by the mid-1950s. Unlike in the recent past, quote, Orientals are generally accepted, but the Negro is a special problem, unquote, contended a San Francisco broker in 1955. Another argued that, quote, Japanese and Chinese are often accepted almost like whites, unquote. But these claims were exaggerated. For discrimination against Asian Americans still occurred throughout Northern California during these years. Still, just within three or four years, white opinions about racial desirability had begun to change remarkably, and within two decades, perceptions of Asian American and black desirability had been almost transposed in the Bay Area, where before World War II, blacks had enjoyed unusual residential mobility, while Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans had been the targets of organized political demonization. Frank Quinn, who was the San Francisco Council for Civic Unity's executive director, revealed the extent of this change when he discussed an incident involving, quote, a Negro doctor who offered $24,000 for a home and was turned down by his race, for his race, uh, be, by the owner. The same home was sold the next week for $22,000 to a Chinese American family. Most Asian American organizations, activists, and citizens initially responded quite cautiously to this changing situation. The only home buyer who publicly linked this experience to the Cold War was a man named Sing Shang, a former Chinese nationalist officer and recent Chinese immigrant whose encounter with housing discrimination in 1952 was the first well-publicized incident of this era. Nor did groups such as the Japanese American Citizens League, the JACL, uh, and the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, none of these groups initially drew these kinds of connections to the Cold War either. Uh, both Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans in California had, by the early 1950s, experienced tremendous difficulties because of the way others connected them to international relations and to their ancestral nations. Aside from Sing Shung, then, these, the Asian Americans in question in these incidents merely expressed their frustration at ongoing housing discrimination. Slowly but surely, however, the equation of Asian Americans and the Cold War in Asia began to change Asian American housing and political strategies. 